As I said last week in my review of Psycho, it was influential not only as being considered one of the best movies of all time, and as the start of the slasher genre, but the movies I'm reviewing this month all connect in weird ways. Halloween, directed by John Carpenter in 1978, was Jamie Lee Curtis's first role, and she'd continue to be a horror exclusive actress until Trading Places in 1983, which I reviewed in this video. She also happens to be the daughter of Janet Lee, who is the star of Psycho. Small world, and I didn't plan this at all, I promise. The budget for the movie was only $300,000, which was incredibly low at the time. It brought in about $65 million. Halloween is considered to be the framework of the slasher genre, albeit accidentally. While there were movies that came before it that had some of the same elements, notably the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween was the movie that made its mark on pop culture. The Final Girl, Invincible, Pure Evil Man, and Sin Equals Death Tropes, which inspired later slasher movies like Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, the latter of which I'll be reviewing next week. Morality sucks. We're all there, but according to Carpenter, they were all just coincidences, except the pure evil Invincible Man, of course. But while those movies took a direct inspiration from Halloween, they also added a ton of blood and gore, something Halloween, at least the original, has very little of. It relies more on lighting and camera work, making it closer to a psychological horror movie than later movies in the series. There are 11 movies in the series, with two currently in production, one re releasing on October 15th, three simply called Halloween, and three separate timelines as different directors made sequels to the original, reboots, and picked and chose movies to retcon. Trying to watch them in any intentional order is practically impossible without a Wikipedia page open. Anyway, while John Carpenter, who directed the first three movies, knows how to scare you with a camera and a candle, other directors aren't as subtle. When you have Rob Zombie leading your project, it's going to be a gore fest. Besides a camera and a candle, they also needed a spooky mask. So what do you do when you need a mask on a budget for Halloween? The same thing the kids do. You go down to the store and buy one for $2. $8 in 2020 money. In this case, it was an easy to find Captain Kirk mask, painted white with the eyes reshaped a bit. Cheapest iconic look ever. Aside from renting the houses on the street and filming in the school, a scene that is almost shot for shot the same as one from It Follows. And also getting some kids to dress up for June Halloween or whenever, they didn't have that many costs. While Psycho had the focus on the killer's mundane life, Halloween takes it to another level by having scenes take place from a first person perspective, making this one of those movies where you yell at the screen, oh god he's standing there doing nothing, she doesn't know. What's more, you don't really know anything about Michael Myers other than the first scene and what's been said about him by the sheriff and Dr. Loomis, in homage to Sam Loomis, Marion's boyfriend and psycho. Over the course of the movie, you realize that he's stalking his prey, finding out how they would act and what they would do in certain situations. For the greater part of the movie, Michael's just mostly being a creepy guy who can disappear at will. Only in the third act does he actually do anything violent, not counting his escape from the asylum. While his kills aren't brutal or gory, they are original and surprising, especially for a genre that had just been invented with this movie. Annie's death, for example, was a perfect example about how to build tension in a scene. After finding the car door locked, she goes and gets the keys, opens the door without a thought, and you can practically hear her thinking, wait, what? Before brushing it off as nothing. This camera angle is something I and probably many other people now can tell is the backseat intruder angle. But instead of immediately getting her throat cut, she pauses, polishes the windshield a bit, and leans back for Michael to strike. Also, unlike most movies, he doesn't just straight up kill her or do something weird and gory. No arrows shoved through the back of the seat and into her neck here. It's an actual struggle, but it feels like one he could end whenever he feels like. Which is after she starts making noise that nobody seems to care about. For a place where all the neighbors seem to know each other and get along, suddenly when there's a murder screams, nobody seems to know each other. It can't be that late with the kids still up, so either they've got some serious soundproofing or they're just uncaring cowards. Well, these people are at least are big cowards. Apparently the only cop in town, Annie's father, ironically, is staring at the Myers house with Dr. Loomis, waiting for a vague something that will never happen. Bob, Linda's boyfriend, I had to look up all these names because Lori's the only real character of the teens, is the only one besides Lori to go looking for Michael when she thinks something's wrong, even if it's just an animal in the house or something. 
I like how he thinks it's his stupid drunk girlfriend messing with him. Her character is essentially be terrible. Go get me a beer. So no, Bob gets stabbed from behind and pinned to the wall. One, that's a strong knife. And two, I now understand guards and stealth games better. You're absolutely convinced that I'm hiding in that locker, but I was under the bed the whole time. Now they're hidden in the locker. Carpenter gave Nick Castle, who played Michael Myers, some pretty basic directions. Don't act. I'd say he pulled it off pretty well, since you never get to see any motion from him, and he never speaks. It's like there's a mask on his heart. He did get a single other bit of direction. As Bob is stuck to the wall, examine his corpse as if it were a butterfly collection. The fact that all his other victims were women and this, the only man, is the only one he kills quickly, and the only one he even has the slightest acting with, leaves a lot of credence to Carpenter's insistence that Halloween isn't a morality story, and more that Michael simply fits the profile of a serial killer. He has a type, and it doesn't include men. I think Bob's kill was one more of necessity than desire, unlike Linda, who he toys with the most. I found this kill funny more than anything, with there being a slutty, drunk, and overall terrible person, it conversely gives credit to the morality theory. Maybe Carpenter did it unconsciously. It's easy to see the points raised for both lines of thought. Finally, Laurie is the only one to not only dodge him, but to get an attack in, even seeming like a mortal wound with the power of knitting. But of course, he gets up and it becomes a running fight throughout the house, as she seems to kill him and leaves weapons for him like an idiot before running to the nearest doorway to cry with her back turned away from him. Fortunately for the viewers, the blurry or shadowy backgrounds build up a nice suspense. And fortunately for Lori, Dr. Loomis hears the screaming earlier and comes to shoot Michael six times and have him fall out the window. Having his body disappear is a great touch as far as endings go. It doesn't feel like a sequel hook. They barely had the support to make the first movie, imagine that. And the idea that he could have just crawled under the corner and bled out is possible, however unlikely. Loomis explains that he's simply pure evil, and that's a superpower. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. As the camera focuses on his house, you know he's still alive, despite all common sense saying the opposite. It's a great and subtle way to say he's still standing, despite taking a beating. It's easy to see Halloween's influence over movies that came out almost immediately after its release. I certainly liked it enough that I'll probably watch the mess of sequels as long as it has the same suspense to blood ratio. Somehow it created a formula that horror movies still follow today. Next week I'll be looking at A Nightmare on Elm Street, which was released only six years later in 1984. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, share, and all that. Since I have to deal with copyright problems with almost every video, especially this month, plus because of violent content, most Horror Month videos are ones I don't make any money from, despite them being my favorite ones to make. Please consider subscribing to my Patreon or Subscribestar, even at the lowest tier. Every dollar counts, especially when I'm literally making nothing for all my work. Thanks for listening to my sales pitch. There's a reason I didn't go into marketing. And I'll see you next time.